Steps for Forensic Readiness Planning The following 10 steps describe the key activities in forensic readiness planning. The first step is define the business scenarios that require digital evidence. The first step in the forensic readiness is to define the purpose of the evidence collection capability. The rationale is to look at the risk and potential impact on the business from the various types of crimes and disputes. What is the threat to the business and what part are vulnerable? That is, in fact, a risk assessment and is performed at the business level. The aim is to understand the business scenarios where digital evidence may be required and may benefit the organization the event that it is required. In general, the areas where digital evidence can be applied include reducing the impact from computer related crime, dealing effectively with court orders to release data, demonstrating compliance with regulatory or legal constraints, producing evidence to support company disciplinary issues, supporting contractual and commercial agreements and proving the impact of a crime or dispute. In assessing these scenarios, this step provides an indication of the likely benefits of being able to use digital evidence. If the identified risks and the potential benefit of the forensic readiness suggest a good return on investment is achievable, then an organization needs to consider what evidence to gather from various risk scenarios. The second step in forensic readiness is for an organization to know what sources of potential evidence are present on or could be generated by their systems and to determine what currently happens to the potential evidence data. Computer logs can originate from many sources. The purpose of this step is to scope what evidence may be available from across the range of systems and applications in use. Some basic questions need to be asked about possible evidence sources to include Where is data generated? What format is it in? How long is it stored for? How is it currently controlled, secured and managed? Who has access to the data? How much is produced? Is it archived? If so, where and for how long? How much is reviewed? What additional evidence sources could be enabled? Who is responsible for this data? Who is the formal owner of the data? How could it be made available to an investigation? What business processes does it relate to? And does it contain personal information? Email is an obvious source of potential rich sources of evidence that needs careful considerations in terms of storing, archiving and auditing and retrieval. But this is not the only means of communication used over the internet. There is also instant messaging, web-based emails that bypass corporate email servers, chat rooms, and news groups, even voice over the internet. Each of these may need preserving and archiving. The range of possible evidence sources includes equipments such as routers, firewalls, servers, clients, portables, 
embedded devices, etc. Application software such as accounting packages for evidence of fraud. ERP packages for employee records and activities, system and management files, etc. Monitoring software such as intrusion detection software, packet sniffers, keyboard loggers, content checkers, etc. General log such as access log, printer logs, web traffic, internal network logs, internet traffic, database transactions, commercial transactions, etc. Other sources such as CCTV, door access records, phone logs, etc. Backups and archives. The third step is determine the evidence collection requirement. It is now possible to decide which of the possible evidence sources identified in step 2 can help deal with the crimes and disputes identified in step 1 and whether further ways to gather evidence are required. This is the evidence collection requirement. The purpose of this step is to produce an evidence requirement statement so that those responsible for managing the business risk can communicate with those running and monitoring information systems through an agreed requirement for evidence. One of the key benefits of this step is the bringing together of IT with the needs of corporate security. IT audit logs have been traditionally configured by system administrators independently of corporate policy and where such a policy exists, there is often a significant gap between organizational security objectives and the bottom-up auditing actually implemented. The evidence collection requirement is moderated by a cost-benefit analysis of how much the required evidence will cost to collect and what benefit it provides. The critical question for successful forensic readiness is what can be performed cost effectively? By considering these issues in advance and choosing storage options, auditing tools, investigation tools and appropriate procedures, it is possible for an organization to reduce the cost for future forensic investigations. The fourth step is establish a capability for securely gathering legally admissible evidence to meet the requirement. At this point, the organization knows the totality of evidence available and has decided which of it can be collected to address the company risk and within a planned budget. With the evidence requirement understood, the next step is to ensure that it is collected from the relevant sources and it is preserved as an authentic record. At this stage, legal advice is required to ensure that the evidence can be gathered legally and the evidence requirement can be met in the manner planned. For example, does it involve monitoring personal emails? the use of personal data or phishing trips on employee activities. In some countries, some or all of these activities may be illegal. Relevant laws in the areas of data protection, privacy and human rights will inevitably constrain what can actually be gathered. Some of the guidelines are Monitoring should be targeted at specific problems. It should only be gathered for defined purposes and nothing more. Staff should be told what monitoring is happening 
except in the exceptional circumstances. Physical security of data such as backup files or on central log servers is important from the data protection point of view and also for secure evidence storage as well as preventive measures such as secure rooms and swipe card access is also prudent to have records of who has access to the general location and who has access to the actual machines containing evidence. Any evidence or paperwork associated with a specific investigation should be given added security. For example, storing in a safe. Additional security of logs can also be achieved through the use of warm storage media. The fifth step is establish a policy for secure storage and handling of potential evidence. The objective of this step is to secure the evidence for a longer term once it has been collected and to facilitate its retrieval if required. It concerns the long term or offline storage of information that might be required for evidence at a later date. A policy for secure storage and handling of potential evidence comprise security measures to ensure the authenticity of data and also procedures to demonstrate that the evidence integrity is preserved whenever it is used, moved or combined with new evidence. In the parallels of investigators, this is known as continuity of evidence and chain of custody. The continuity of evidence also includes the record of who held and who has access to the evidence. The sixth step is ensure monitoring and auditing is triggered to detect and deter major incidents. In addition to gathering evidence for later use in court, evidence sources can be monitored to detect threatened incidents in a timely manner. This is directly analogous to intrusion detection system. Extended beyond network attack to a wide range of behaviors that may have implication for the organization. It is all very well collecting the evidence. This step is about making sure it can be used in the process of detection. By monitoring sources of evidence, we can look for triggers that mean something suspicious may be happening. The critical question in this step is, when should an organization be suspicious? A suspicious event has to be related to business risk and not couched in technical terms. Thus, the onus is on managers to explain to those monitoring the data what they want to prevent and thus the sort of behavior that ideas might be used to detect this should be captured in a suspicion policy that helps the various monitoring and auditing staff understand what triggers should provoke suspicion. Who to report the suspicion to? Whether highlighting monitored is required? And whether any additional security measures should be taken as a precaution? Each type of monitoring should produce a proportion of false positives. The sensitivity of triggers can be varied as long as the overall false positive rate does not become so high that suspicious event cannot be properly reviewed. Varying triggers also guards against the risk from someone who know what the threshold on a particular event is and make sure 
any events or transactions he wishes to hide are beneath it. The seventh step is specify circumstances when escalation to a full formal investigation is required. Some suspicious event can be system generated, such as by the rule base of an IDS or the keywords of the content checked and some will be triggered by human watchfulness. Each suspicious event found in step 6 needs to be reviewed. Either an event will require escalation if it is clearly serious enough or it will require enhanced monitoring or other precautionary measures or it is a false positive. The purpose of this step is to decide how to react to the suspicious event. The decision as to whether to escalate the situation to management will depend on any indication that a major business impact is likely or that a full investigation may be required where digital evidence may be needed. The decision criteria should be captured in an escalation policy that makes it clear when a suspicious event becomes a confirmed incident. At this point, an investigation should be launched and policy should indicate who the point of contact are and who else need to be involved. As with step 3 and 6, the network and IT security managers and the non-IT managers need to understand each other's position. What level of certainty or level of risk is appropriate for an escalation? What strength of case is required to proceed? A preliminary business impact assessment should be made based on whether any of the following are present. Evidence of a reportable crime, evidence of internal fraud, theft, other losses, estimate of possible damages, potential for embarrassment, reputation loss, any immediate impact on customers, partners or profitability. Recovery plans have been enacted or are required. The incident is reportable under a compliance regime. The eighth step is train staff so that all those involved understand their role in the digital evidence process and the legal sensitivities of evidence. A wide range of staff may become involved in the computer security incident. The aim of this step is to ensure that appropriate training is developed to prepare staff for the various roles they may play before, during and after the incident. It is also necessary to ensure that a staff is competent to perform any rules related to the handling and preservation of evidence. There will be some issues relevant to all staff if they become involved in an incident. The following group will require most specialized awareness training, for example, the investigating team, corporate HR department, Corporate PR department, owners of business processes or data, line management, profit center managers, corporate security, system administrators, IT managers, legal advisors, and senior management. At all times, those involved should act according to the need to know principle. They should be particularly aware 
whether any staff such as whistleblowers and investigators need to be protected from possible retaliation by keeping their names and their involvement confidential. Training may also be required to understand the relationships and necessary communications with external organizations that may become involved. The ninth step is present an evidence-based case describing the incident and its impact. The aim of an investigation is not just to find the culprit or repair any damage. An investigation has to provide answers to questions and demonstrate why those answers are credible. The questions go along the lines of who, what, why, when, where and how. Credibility is provided by evidence and a logical argument. The purpose of this step is to produce a policy that describes how an evidence-based case should be assembled. A case file may be required for a number of reasons. To provide a basis for interaction with legal advisors and law enforcement. To support a report to a regulatory body. To support an insurance claim. To provide feedback on how such an incident can be avoided in future. To provide a record in case of a similar event in the future. The tenth and the final step is ensure legal review to facilitate action in response to the incident. At certain point during the collection of cybercrime case files, it will be necessary to review the case from a legal standpoint and get legal advice on any follow-up actions. Legal advisors should be able to advise on the strength of the case and suggest whether additional measures should be taken. For example, if the evidence is weak, is it necessary to catch an internal suspect red-handed by monitoring their activity and seizing their PC? Any progression to a formal action will need to be justified, cost-effective and assessed as likely to end in the company's favor. Although the actual decision of how to proceed will clearly be post-incident, considerable legal preparation is required in readiness. Legal advisors should be trained and experienced in the appropriate cyber laws and evidence admissibility issues. They need to be prepared to act on an incident pursuant to the digital evidence that has been gathered and the case presented in step 9. Legal advice should also recognize that the legal issues may span legal jurisdiction. Advice from legal advisors will include any liabilities from the incident and how they can be managed, findings and prosecuting or punishing legal and regulatory constraint on what action can be taken, reputation protection and PR issues, when or if to advise partners, customers and investors, how to deal with employees, resolving commercial disputes and any additional measures required.